Um, great. Well, hello and welcome everybody to webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST. Um, my name is Anna Weinberg, and I am a CCAST Research Specialist uh, at the University of Arizona based in Tucson. Um, I'm also the coordinator of the CCAST Drought Adaptation Community of Practice. So if you are interested in kind of the drought adaptation sides of some of the things we talk about in these webinars and today, uh, please send me an email after the webinar. My email will be uh, found later at the end. Um, but today, CCAST launched this webinar series in April of 2020. Our webinars are focused primarily on the control of non-native aquatic species in support of this community of practice, um, but we are also featuring additional aquatic species conservation and management case study presentations as we go. So I will pass it over to Alex, who will introduce our speaker for the day. Yeah, thanks, Anna. I'm Alex Caberly, and I'm also a research specialist here at the University of Arizona, and I'm the coordinator of the Southwest Non-Native Aquatics Community of Practice. So today we're really exci excited to have a presentation from Dimitri Vidergar, who will be presenting on bull trout research and management in Idaho. So a couple uh, miles away from Tucson, but it's uh, fun to be able to expand our scope. Dimitri is a fish biologist with the Bureau of Reclamation in the Snake River office in Boise, Idaho. Just a reminder, if you do have any questions for Dimitri during his presentations, please feel free to enter them in the chat box and I will relay them to uh, Dimitri at the end of his presentation for a question and answer session. So now I'd like to turn it over to Dimitri for his presentation. Excellent. Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you, Anna and Alex and the rest of the CAST program for the opportunity to, to share some work that our team has been involved with in Southwest Idaho. Uh, you'll see on this, uh, on this opening slide here, there are three pictures of fish, and only one of them is bull trout. And in a few minutes, hopefully you will be able to identify which one is the char, and of, of the char, which one is a bull trout. Okay, the focus of the work that was spotlighted by CAST is a radial telemetry study that was used primarily to identify the migratory behavior of bull trout in the Boise River watershed in Southwest Idaho. Today, I'd like to use that study as a hub to provide a greater context of the work because I feel that taking a, a little bit bigger picture view may spur some thought as to how you might be able to apply portions of this work to your study area or bring up discussion that might help us in future work. First, I'd like to acknowledge some of the project partners. It may seem like an odd collaboration, but many of the ideas that I'll bring up today spawned from discussions between these groups including potential solutions to ESA requirements and thinking about the system holistically. The CAST program is also very much a part of this collaborative think tank. For the presentation today, I will cover a background of bull trout. I'll overview the study area. I'll introduce some of the methods, um, some of the findings, and then briefly discuss lessons learned, share some of the data networks that we used, and then hopefully if I don't stray too much on stories, then there should be a little time for questions or discussion at the end. For those of you not familiar with bull trout, I'll provide a little background. Bull trout are a salmonid fish that is distributed across Northwest, the Northwest United States and into Canada. As a general characteristic of salmonids, they require cooler, well oxygenated water throughout the year. And they also construct nests that we, that we call reds um, in which they, they lay their eggs. You are most likely to encounter bull trout in the most isolated, coldest and pristine portions of watershed. 
visually, bull trout are often grouped as trout, but technically a member of the char family. And that also includes brook trout, lake trout, Arctic char, and several other species. An easy way to tell char apart from the Western trout are that char are characterized by light spots on a dark background as you can see in the illustration on the, the upper uh, right side of the, of the slide. And this is opposed to Western trout, like the cutthroat trout that have dark spots on a lighter background. Uh, char can also be identified by a white leading edge on their ventral fins. So it's, it's not quite as obvious in this in this illustration, uh, but in the in the photograph on the lower left, you can see the white leading edge on these these ventral fins. Um, you can occasionally see a, a tip on uh, on rainbow or on cutthroat, but it's that that entire length of white, and that'll that'll show up in some other pictures that I have later in the presentation. Uh, the the illustration on the upper right shows a rather nondescript uh, fish. However, during, during the, the spawning phase, uh, bull trout will, will morph into a, a cloak of bright colors and the males will develop this extended jaw. And that's, that's to, to make them look more appealing and be more uh, competitive for, um, for opportunities to mate. The female in the lower left here go through some of those same changes. It's just not quite as dramatic as the males. So I'll, I'll share a video here in a second. Uh, the, the video credit goes to Elliot Lindsay, and he, he was able to capture a spawning migration of larger migratory bull trout um, somewhere in Canada. Uh, but but before I, I start the video, take note of a few things. So I, I, I mentioned a few of the characteristics of salmonids, um, and that's the adipose fin. You can just see a little bit of that of that here, but it'll be it'll be more obvious once the video starts. Um, you can also see the white leading edge on some of these fish, and then you should also be able to tell the difference between the males and the females, even though the coloration is just getting started and or when this video was taken. Now, bull trout demonstrate three different life history strategies that protect the species against catastrophic loss. In larger systems with suitable habitat, like the Boise system, bull trout exhibit all three life history strategies. The first is the resident life form. And these are individuals that will spend their entire life in a relatively small area in close proximity to their natal origin. For example, a small mountain stream. And these individuals will not get much larger than nine or 10 inches. The other life history strategy are fluvial fish. And those are fish that will migrate from their spawning areas to larger rivers during a portion of the year. And the third strategy are adfluvial fish. And these are fish that will use um, reservoirs or lakes like their ocean. And they'll migrate long distances sometimes between spawning and overwintering habitat. And this, this strategy, as I mentioned, is referred to as adfluvial. These fish, like the ones in the video, uh, will get the largest of the three strategies because they're able to move from the best seasonal habitat and, and feeding areas. But that diversity of behavior poses some challenges, and I'll bring some of those up uh, later in the talk because you always have to consider what life history stage and what age of fish that you're capturing or examining with your research questions. 
in an intact ecosystem, bull trout will typically coexist with other native fishes, such as uh, kokanee salmon, the non-anadromous form of sockeye salmon, uh, white fish, rainbow or cutthroat trout, sucker species, and a variety of smaller of smaller species like sculpin or dace. These species are also considered cool or cold water species requiring the same um, habitat uh, requirements as bull trout, and they're also an important prey item for bull trout. Uh, let me see here. Did not mean to play that over again. All right. What is the ecological importance of bull trout? Um, anyone who studied bull trout has heard stories from the old timers that their father or grandfather used to kill bull trout. Bull trout are pisivorous, so they do eat other fish, and many people view predators as competition for their favorite kind of fish. So yes, less than 50 years ago, there were large scale management efforts to reduce the numbers of bull trout using a variety of methods, including bounties and even poison. However, now bull trout are considered more of an indicator species whose presence represents pristine habitat that's able to buffer against climate variability and anthropogenic variables. Current management of bull trout is largely guided by federal protections because bull trout is listed as a threatened species under the Endangered Species Act. There are six different recovery units in the US and the study area that I'll be talking about today is in the Upper Snake Recovery Unit. And this area represents one of the furthest southern extents of the bull trout's range. I'll describe more of the nexus to the Endangered Species Act later, uh, but some of the terms that I'll use throughout the talk will have, will have reference to, sorry, to ESA terms. All right, drilling down a little bit here, uh, taking a closer look at the upper snake recovery unit. Within this unit, there are 22 separate core areas that represent genetically unique populations. And the one that I'll be focusing on today, if you can see the yellow cursor here, it's the Ararat Reservoir um, core area. So now that I've talked a little bit about bull trout, I'll describe a little more about the study area, including a mention of a couple of the most influential environmental variables in the basin. One being water management and the other one is wildfire. When you fly into Boise, you get the view of a, of a lush floodplain bordered by a lot of sagebrush, grass, and steep hills that blend to pine forests at the higher elevations. Uh, points of reference on the study area map here that will come up throughout the talk. We have the city of Boise and kind of uh, the, the middle part of the, the figure here on the left side. There are three large reservoirs um, within the upper Boise system, Lucky Peak, Arrow Rock, and Anderson Ranch. Uh, there are a couple of gauges that will come up in reference. Uh, these are river gauges. There's one at Neal Bridge. There's one at Twin Springs. And one way of, of sampling fish, which we which we used for this particular study was to capture fish at migration weirs. And we have two migration weirs that we used to capture fish for this, this telemetry work. One is on the middle fork of the Boise. The other one is on the north fork of the Boise. 
Uh, I also mentioned uh, that the that the fish within the study area that we tried to focus on are the adfluvial fish. So these are fish that migrate um, long distances sometimes and and looking at the study area map here these fish will spend some of these fish will spend portion of the year below anderson ranch dam and along the 26 miles of the south fork boise river down to arrow rock reservoir they'll spend some time in arrow rock reservoir and then they'll migrate to their spawning uh, tributaries in either the headwaters of the middle fork or the headwaters of the north fork Sometimes these migrations will take the fish up to 90 miles. Uh, also, before I leave this slide, uh, there's no fish passage at either one of the three uh, dams. And, and even though there is, um, so I, I did uh, forget to mention Kirby Dam. Um, Kirby Dam is a small project that does have fish passage, um, but, but before I leave this slide, um, another thing to mention is that the South Fork Boise River between Anderson Ranch Dam and Arrow Rock Dam um, is considered a tailwater fishery, whereas the Middle Fork and the North Fork are both unmanaged. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, water management plays a huge role in the presence of, of migratory bull trout in the Boise system. Next, I'll provide a little context of the relative size of the reservoirs, starting with the uppermost. Anderson Ranch was built in 1950 and originally authorized for irrigation water supply, hydropower development, flood control, fish conservation, and recreation. The reservoir is approximately 475,000 acre feet. It's about 14 miles long and generally less than a mile wide. Arrow Rock uh, Dam is the oldest dam in the Boise system. And when it was constructed, it was the tallest dam in the world at just under 350 feet. The reservoir is approximately 272,000 acre feet and it's about 12 miles long and generally less than half a mile wide. The project was originally authorized for irrigation water supply. And Lucky Peak, the lowest of the three uh, larger, larger dams, was constructed by the Army Corps of, Engineer, of Engineers in 1950 and was originally authorized for irrigation water supply, flood control, and recreation. The reservoir is approximately 264,000 acre feet. It's about 11 miles long and generally less than a mile wide. Um, only Arrow Rock and Anderson Ranch projects are reclamations, but all three of the reservoir projects are managed collaboratively. The history of wildfire also plays an important role in the basin. Fire is a frequent occurrence in the watershed, and this map depicts large fires that have occurred in the short time since bull trout were federally listed. Each separate fire is shaded in a different color, and the South Fork uh, Boise River, the Middle Fork Boise River, and the North Fork Boise River are highlighted um, in this figure, along with the other points of reference that I mentioned earlier. These fires are an important process over the long run. However, in the short run, they can block fish passage, increase sediment, result in more flashy hydrographs that can scour reds and affect recruitment. Being a federally protected species, the Bureau of Reclamation is required to study and monitor the effects of reservoir operations on bull trout. The ESA consultation for bull trout was completed in 2005, and the consultation for bull trout critical habitat was completed in 2014. Those two processes provided guidance on studies and monitoring requirements. 
there are six focus points or focus areas for bull trout listed on the left side of the slide and nine focus areas for bull trout critical habitat, a few of which are listed on the right side. The critical habitat elements are also referred to as primary biological features. Thinking about how best to tackle the studies and monitoring, uh, it, it was important for us to consider how the terms and conditions and critical habitat elements interact. This figure shows the interactions of those requirements for another uh, project of ours that is much smaller than the Boise project, but it does stress the importance of looking at this work holistically. For example, making a small change in outflow has the potential to affect, in this case, each one of the, of the five terms and conditions, and in turn, each one of the nine critical habitat elements in both the reservoir and the river. So thinking about it in that context, one action can cause many, many reactions. I have briefly described bull trout now and where they live and why we have an interest in studying them and what questions we need to study. Now getting into to more of the of the fun part for the for the fisheries folks, and that's how the how the data was collected. Some of the common data collection methods that we used to sample bull trout included uh, migratory weirs and reservoir netting, eDNA collections from some of the project partners in tributaries, and using telemetry to describe migration patterns. Habitat assessment methods included temperature monitoring using gauges or thermal infrared flights, habitat surveys collected on the ground or sometimes using LIDAR to collect habitat features over a larger scale, and water quality modeling, sorry, in the reservoirs. On the study map, I mentioned using a couple uh, migration weirs to capture bull trout in the fall as they return to the reservoir post-spawning. And this is a picture of one of those weirs. This method uh, of, of using migratory weirs focuses on capturing the migratory component of the ad fluvial life history of bull trout that use the reservoir for foraging, migratory, or overwintering habitat. We also use trap nets, beach chains, and short set gill nets in the reservoir for capturing bull trout during the winter while they were present in the reservoir. eDNA was also used by project partners to identify presence absence in spawning tributaries or within the migration corridor. Once captured, bull trout were surgically fit with radio telemetry or sonic tags for tracking. The lower picture, uh, you can see the sutures from that surgery and, and then the antenna um, exits behind the pelvic fins and trails behind the fish. We also surgically attack, attached archival tags for recording <clears throat> the temperature and depth that the fish use. The upper picture shows one of those tags attached just under the dorsal fin rays. Once tagged, the fish were tracked using aircraft, ground surveys, fixed site telemetry stations, or a combination of all three methods. A couple of the differences in the tags that I just mentioned is that the telemetry and sonic tags will transmit data when the tag is within a detectable distance from a receiver. So the more you track, the more data that you get. Um, whereas archival tags store the data. So in order to retrieve that, you have to recapture a tagged fish and then download the data 
in order to get that, that macro scale habitat that the fish were using. So as you can imagine, sample size plays a key role in success of a project that uses um, archival tags and to some extent um, telemetry tags as well, especially when the fish are, are migrating as far as they do. Data collection uh, included, well, for the, for the habitat aspect, um, data collection included um, habitat assessments that were either, that mapped habitat at a larger scale using aircraft in some cases. The thermal infrared sensors are shown here. Uh, the, the LIDAR data was also collected in a similar, in this, uh, using similar methods or at a smaller scale, um, doing stream surveys on foot or collecting uh, water quality profiles in the, in the reservoirs. There are many moving parts um, involved with, the, with this work and I'm, I'm only touching on a few of them today uh, but in order to make best use of the time, I'll describe some of the study findings at a higher level rather than going into any detail or a lot of detail on any particular part. But I'm, I'm more than happy to discuss the details of, of anything presented in the talk today. Um, at, a, at a later time, you can all have my contact in, information at the end of the presentation. Many of the study findings that have come up uh, may seem to apply more to the migration corridor or the habitat condition in the tributaries, but ultimately all these findings are being used to identify effects of the reservoir operations on bull trout and more realistic solutions that will be able to take advantage of oftentimes the little bit of operational flexibility that's available um, and, and use that to the benefit of bull trout and their habitat. So for the study findings, I'll, I'll touch on habitat use uh, within, within that, well, within the watershed, within the study area. I'll also touch on, um, on the migration timing I'll touch a little bit on the climate variability and the effects of that on bull trout and their habitat. I'll also mention a bioenergetics model that was developed as part of this work, the habitat availability, and then a little bit on the riparian regeneration project that, that was part of this work. Migratory bull trout can travel in this system um, up to 90 miles, during which they will encounter a lot of obstacles, including barriers, um, varying degrees of cold water refugia, predators, anglers, and food availability. This figure is a snippet from the thermal infrared flight that, that just looking at this, at this very small snippet here, uh, we can see a warming trend um, as you move downstream. Uh, you can see, well, so, so the, the cooler water is depicted by the, by the darker colors, as you can see on the scale, and then the warmer uh, water is represented by the, by the lighter, brighter colors. So we can see areas of cooler, cooler flow, uh, usually in the Thalweg of the channel, and then the, the margins of the, of the stream show some warming trends. And this figure is also good to, to show a less common varial, variable that is common in the Boise system, and that's the influence of geothermal. So in this figure, you can see these off-channel pockets of yellow and red and those represent uh, geothermal influence, which we did want to look at because bull trout being a cold water obligate species, um, when they migrate through these areas, we wanted to see if they were, were still able to take advantage of some of the 
colder water pockets or if they quickly move through these areas. So the thermal infrared imagery um, allows us to look at a lot at larger scale trends across the study area. And I, I should also uh, mention that the thermal infrared imagery is just a snapshot. So those flights are done over the course of a day. And, and, and so they, they only represent um, the, the conditions at that time. But we chose to do those during the summer base flow. So they should represent the conditions with the warmest temperatures and the lowest flow of the year. So using the temperature data um, from the thermal infrared flights, this is another um, snapshot of one of those, uh, those snippets from the from the, the thermal infrared flight. And you can see in this one, there uh, are a number of bull trout uh, tracking locations, which are shown by the, by the green dots. Uh, but to focus here, uh, this, this figure in, in the lower left of the slide is from the South Fork Boise River. And here we can, we can look at the seasonal temperature vari uh, variability in the places that bull trout use. For example, um, as you move downstream and downstream, so, so the flow in this figure uh, goes from left to right. So below Anderson Ranch Dam, water that is discharged from the, from the lower stratum of the reservoir is cooler. And then as you move downstream, you see a warming pattern the vertical bars here represent tributaries entering the river. And you can see a little bit of influence, thermal influence, but they're not very big tributaries. So where we see this, this cooling trend, that, that would represent areas of springs or of groundwater influence. And for bull trout that use this area throughout the year, areas like this are important to them as well as areas like this. The temperature data is also, also important at a smaller scale. And in this figure, we can see uh, telemetry locations uh, superimposed on the thermal infrared imagery. And we can see the I think this is just one fish. Um, I can't recall, but this fish was using this area um, on its upstream migration. And we can also see some other, um, some other features in this figure. Uh, there's a road that goes along the left side of the river in this case, a bridge, an off-channel pond or geothermal influence. And then this tag looks like it's out of the water, and it is. It's in the, it's in the truck that was used for the tracking, and, um, and that was a good test for us to make sure that the receiver was working. So the temperature data, um, and in particular, the thermal infrared imagery, allows us to look at large scale and small scale um, uh, habitat availability and habitat use by the bull trout. As I mentioned before, we use the telemetry data and habitat data to better understand the timing of when bull trout use the reservoir and when they migrate into the river and the river corridor um, in route to their spawning locations. So the next um, the next few slides, I'll touch on some of the telemetry findings, the temperature data from the temperature and depth sensors, and then more of the data from the archival tags. Bull trout migration in the Boise system is quite interesting. The, the fish exhibit a variety of, of migratory habits. Um, some of the fish 
will spawn on consecutive years, while others may skip a year or two from spawning. And, and those fish may spend some time in the river during the year, or they may spend time in that tailwater section. And, and then the fish will begin their migrations from the reservoir anywhere from February through June. Uh, one thing is consistent, though, between all of their migratory um, habits, and that's that the larger adfluvial fish all use the reservoir during a portion of the year. And when they are in the reservoir, we wanted to find out what habitat they're using and how the reservoir operations may cue the fish when it's important for them to leave. We were also able to couple the migration timing data with the water quality modeling to better understand what might cue the bull trout to migrate. And if the later migrants might be at a survival or spawning disadvantage. I, I won't go into a lot of depth here on the water quality model, but this figure uh, depicts conditions, modeled conditions in June towards the tail end of when the bull trout might be moving. And we found um, with, the, with the telemetry that the bull trout in the reservoir show a daily pattern. They like to, to forage in the shallow shoreline areas at night and then during the day they'll, they'll, they'll retreat to the deeper portions of the reservoir. So as um, these seasonal warming trends, it's likely that, that those will cue the fish that are still in the reservoir to migrate. And at that time, it's important for us to know the condition of, of the migratory corridor. So will the, will the culverts allow um, fish to move in and out of the reservoir? Will the delta allow passage um, in and out? And then Will the water quality um, limit them or slow them down on their movement from the reservoir to more of that spawning or summer habitat? It's often tempting to get caught up in any one of these individual components of, of the research and forget about the big picture and how the watershed acts as a whole. I've talked, or I, I've mentioned many times during the talk, and I'll continue to mention um, how it's important to view this work holistically. And part of that involves making the data available in a form that's easily incorporated into into other studies or easily incorporated into other research questions. And uh, the data report that's listed here on the slide is a great example of that. Um, in collaboration with the USGS, we were able to consolidate our georeference telemetry data from both the radio and sonic tracking to a single data series report. This way we're able to move more or to more readily use that data um, in examples like I showed previously uh, with combining the telemetry and the thermal data or to look at how to prioritize culvert replacement or fire history influences with the movement of, of bull trout. Another use of the data was in the development of a bioenergetics model. I've been lucky enough to work on on a number of different bioenergetic models, but this one, this one's really cool. Uh, we, we were able to use the temperature data that was collected from the telemetry study, the migration timing, and then the overwintering diets of bull trout that used either the tailwater section or the reservoir, and use those different components to calculate energy use for female bull trout during the year. So knowing when the fish move out of the tailwater section into the reservoir, and then when they move out of the reservoir into the river, 
and looking at the temperature patterns within each one of those three areas, then we were able to determine the likelihood of successful spawning and the frequency of alternative year spawning based on energy availability. And the citation at the bottom of the slide has, has all the details um, with that work. In general though, uh, that, that bioenergetic model used the known um, accumulated energy for char during a, well, during their migration and spawning and an appropriate energy threshold that's needed in order for those fish to successfully spawn. With this information, we used the model then to estimate the energy potential of bull trout under a variety of migratory scenarios and conditions. And then we were, we were able to model what proportion of the simulated population would successfully spawn. So again, thinking about the system holistically, um, migratory bull trout persist in this watershed in large part because of water management, but their long-term persistence is also challenged by water management in both the Boise reservoirs and along the, mi the migratory corridor. The variable nature of the study area makes it very difficult to anticipate the effects of climate variability. This figure shows how warming may affect stream temperatures across the Northwest into the future. In addition, the effects of warming may be exacerbated by fire and the subsequent de debris flows. For example, within the study area, we observed in one case, a 75 year rain event in a small basin to the South Fork Boise River. And then in the very adjacent uh, basin, we saw drought conditions. So the intensity, duration, timing, and variability of natural events like this one are very difficult to model, but the unpredictable nature, it's just, a regular part of this watershed. And as I mentioned before, this, this recovery unit represents one of the furthest southern extents of bull trout. And so we would almost expect more variability in, in some of these um, climate, climate scenarios. And these all pose uh, stresses to the bull trout. So data from the telemetry and archival tags provide a better understanding of the thermal habitats and other features that the bull trout rely on in a watershed. And when severe climate events do occur, we have a better idea of the effects um, of those events and we're able to identify appropriate measures to improve conditions in the short term. And the paper um, shown here uh, makes some of those connections between climate variability and habitat availability within the study area. I've already shared some of the habitat findings, but this is a, this is a good reminder of how limited water resources of how limited water resources are in the West and how there's often very little flexibility in dam operations to provide ecological benefits. And that's why it's so important to consider the system holistically because seasonal limitations in one area may mean benefits in another. For example, after the 2013 wildfires across the study area, there, was, there were several big debris flows that reshaped large sections of the South Fork Boise River. And that tailwater section, as I discussed earlier, is very important for bull trout. Fortunately, this is a tailwater portion and Reclamation was able to provide flushing flows to redistribute the sediment at strategic times 
allowing benefits to the river and the downstream reservoir for habitat quality. And this paper, this paper um, listed here talks about some of those, um, how some of those dots are connected between, uh, between a managed system, climate variability, and then habitat, habitat availability. Riparian regeneration was also an important uh, focal point of this work. And riparian revegetation varies following wildfire, debris flows, drought, um, a lack of recruitment for other reasons, um, overgrazing, et cetera. So tying back to the telemetry work, bull trout rely heavily on large woody debris distributed along the entire migration corridor. Um, so much so that during one of the large wildfires, we were able to track fish and how they responded uh, to both the time period during the fire and then the time period during the debris flows. And we found that those fish didn't vacate the area. They found the next available habitat with the same features and they settled in. In some cases, it was only a couple hundred yards away. So this behavior helps to show the importance of large woody debris to the system. And if there's no recruitment of new trees, then what happens in 20 or 30 years? It takes 30 or 40 years for cottonwood to reach the size that when the branches break off, they're large enough to provide bull trout cover when they fall in the river. And if there's little or no recruitment of riparian trees, then what happens when the mature trees die? Water management plays an important role in the tailwater areas because it affects groundwater flow and seed recruitment. There have been a few of the larger study findings uh, well, I've, I've discussed some of the larger um, study findings, but that only really touches the surface. And for every one of the larger projects that's, that we're able to, to publish the results from, there are dozens of other questions and, and, and smaller findings that, that don't get included in those. Um, but before I wrap up, I wanted to, to share a few of the lessons learned and share some of the data networks that were, that were part of this work. It's sometimes easy to, compart to compartmentalize a system like the Boise by the reservoirs, by the rivers, or by the tributaries. But in order to really understand what's important to the species of interest, whether it's the bull trout, uh, whether it's a bird or a mammal or plants, it is important to think about the system holistically. Also, a thorough analysis does not exclude the need to monitor, but it does help to define the appropriate levels and methods in which to monitor. And finally, collaboration is critical to finding realistic solutions. A large part of the collaborative team and collaborative data pool are the data networks and the ease of acquiring the available data. A few of the data networks that were used in this work included stream gauges and data series reports and crowdsourcing data libraries that included uh, the Norwest uh, Stream Temperature uh, Library, the Aquatic eDNA Atlas, and photo journals. It certainly takes an army to get these projects done. And when a project um, of this size is completed, the credit goes to many. Oops.
boy, it feels like we just started this a minute ago. Uh, but before I close, I can take some questions if there's time and also encourage you to, to contact me uh, later if you'd like to discuss anything that I've talked about today. Um, and you can also reference the work that, that Reclamation um, has done at the website that's listed here. You can also do a Google search for uh, Reclamation Bull Trout and it should take you to the same site. And I think I have one more slide. Alex, do I turn it over to you now or? You can leave this up for now, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you, Dimitri. So we have about 10 minutes for questions. So if folks want to um, jump in, feel free to write a question in the chat box, or you can also turn your web camera on and ask Dimitri your question directly. Um, but thank you, Dimitri, for presenting that. That's some really uh, complicated, robust uh, research going on with a lot of different components that I think folks here too will find um, certainly uh, interesting and, and, and relevant for some of the work that we're, uh, we have going on here. Um, I do, I have a question uh, to start and we'll give folks a minute or two to add their questions to the chat. Um, but I was curious, you mentioned that um, these, uh, this bull trout population had a lot of um, life history variation, particularly the timing of migration. Were any of those findings um, used by management? Like, do you have any specific uh, management recommendations or actions that could be taken, particularly with the reservoir operations that might help um, when thinking about these uh, different strategies for the um, timing of migrations? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and it, it did shed light on, on really um, the, the scale that we should be thinking about with, with changes in, in reservoir operations or with updating reservoir operations. As I mentioned, um, the ESA requirements kind of guide some of those specific questions, but there is um, opportunities within that, that process to update um, some of the operations. For example, uh, ramping rates, uh, refill, um, the, the rate of refill, and how the water is moved within the watershed. So, so one one of the one of the points to to remember from that is that um, the fish are moving during such a wide window, uh, February through June, but then they also are present in that tailwater area throughout the year, and in some cases for a couple of years before they migrate. So any any change in operation in operations that's considered needs to take that into account. So very, very important information there. It's not just seasonal, it's more, um, it's more on the scale of years that, that these decisions should be, um, should be considered. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, feel free to add your questions. Uh, and also if you wanna uh, ask directly, again, you can um, unmute yourself. So we'll give folks a few minutes. Um, I do have some other questions too, so I don't I don't want to take up all the Q and A here, but um, we'll see if we get any others any other questions come in. Yeah, I, I was also wondering too. You mentioned the importance of large woody debris. Are, are you aware of Are there any active like habitat restoration projects going on in the system, or any um, large woody debris input, like particularly for the species? Yeah, one of the one of the papers that I listed on the slide uh, looks more into the the details of frequency of water events to to assure uh, recruitment of cottonwoods, um, but in terms of of um, of projects that that change or improve the habitat those are challenging here because this is a working system and so to add large woody debris 
to make channel changes. We have to account for, for effects to private property. We have to take into account um, how those changes might affect uh, flood control operations. And, and there's also um, uh, road networks that go through portions of the, of the study area. So considering all of those different aspects is important uh, before, we, before we embark on any habitat restoration efforts, but specifically to the cottonwood, um, some of the study findings suggested that the frequency of high water events um, that allow the groundwater um, exchange between those, those riparian areas and the main channel, and then allow um, that water to, uh, the, the, the groundwater to retreat at a, at a pace that still allows the, the young trees to, to take advantage of that water. The frequency of those events is the important thing. So that's going to be the focus uh, moving into the future rather than any, any larger scale restoration efforts. We're, we're going to be focusing on the frequency of those higher flows that provide those conditions for recruitment. Okay. Got a few more minutes here. Um, yeah, don't be shy. Feel free to uh, write your questions in for Dimitri. Yeah, so we I can also add. Oh, go ahead, Alex. Um, yeah, we have a uh, question from Genevieve here. Hi, Dimitri, just to clarify, is there management flexibility to allow for those higher flow events um, for habitat purposes? There is a little bit, uh, and, and part of that process, though, is, is being able to, to provide uh, the data to show when the fish are in those areas, and then specifically, the habitat that they're using. And so now that we have that, uh, we'll, we'll be able to have those discussions and, and balancing that with flood control and then with, um, with the delivery of, of the, the irrigation uh, rights. That's the challenge here, but there is some flexibility for that. Typically, that would be um, in the spring, but it could also be um, in the fall. And in some cases, um, we've seen benefits to the, the mobilization and redistribution of sediment along with some, some of those higher flows at a, at a certain uh, uh, frequency and duration. And so there is some opportunity to to get both those benefits. So the, the sediment and gravel uh, redistribution and higher flows that will allow the, the, the seedlings to, uh, to persist after that first year. So Genevieve, uh, following up, it shows the importance of having this kind of data to figure out if or when we have flexibility in meeting multiple water management goals. Yeah, very, very true. Um, and and as I mentioned, a lot of a lot of the the work that we're doing is guided uh, through through ESA and the requirements that that we need to uh, to keep an eye on for both bull trout and the critical habitat. Uh, and and that's that's where this work is challenging, but also very rewarding because coming up with realistic solutions oftentimes uh, requires thinking outside the box. And it may not be it may not be planting trees 
uh, for this recruitment. It may be, it may be um, pulsing flows uh, maybe every five or 10 years to, to provide that. So um, yeah, it's like I said uh, before, it's, it's looking at this holistically, but also being realistic about the flexibility that we do have. Um, there are oftentimes uh, numerous uh, potential solutions to to uh, to a question to a research question, but we have to ask: Are they realistic given the the management uh, that that's already present within the system? So we have a question from Max, um, and after this. We'll stay on for just a few more minutes. Um, we can probably take another question or so. Um, but Matt, Max wanted to know, uh, have you mapped the locations of springs that provide thermorphugia? We have an idea of where those are at uh, based on the thermal infrared flights, but we haven't gone to the scale of mapping each one of those individual ones. And, and part of that is because We've seen uh, through the through the the thermal preferences of the of the migratory fish, we've seen that they can tolerate um, warmer temperatures for short periods of time while they're in that migratory corridor. So having um, having springs at a set interval isn't as important as knowing that they're um, distributed throughout the watershed. So there hasn't been the need at this time to map out the springs at that scale, uh, but it is important to know the reaches that those are in so that if, um, if operations need to, need to be adjusted, then we know the effects of that and how, how long it takes for the temperature to adjust and for the flow to adjust, allowing movement between those, those areas with spring or groundwater influence? Good question. All right, so I'll give folks like 10 more seconds. If you have a last minute question for Dimitri, feel free to ask. All right, um, Dimitri, do you mind uh, moving to the next slide? Sure. There we go. So, uh, so for my part, I'd like to uh, like to thank everyone for listening today, and uh, thanks for spending the last hour or so with me and. I'd also like to thank uh, Matt, Genevieve, Larry, Alex, and Anna. And if you'd like to reference uh, the, the case study today, the link is on this, this page. And also feel free to reach out to me um, either through the contact information that I had or it should also be on the, on the CAS poster as well. Yeah, thank you so much, Dimitri, and thank you everyone for taking the time to join us this morning. Um, like we mentioned, this webinar was recorded and will be made available on the CCAST YouTube channel. Uh, if you've missed the previous webinars, those recordings have also been posted, um, and you can find our channel by searching for CCAST YouTube, or I dropped the link to the channel um, in the chat there. Uh, you're also invited to visit us on CCAST on our main website, where we have a case study on the bull trout telemetry work that was presented by Dimitri today. Um, and as he mentioned, that link is there. Uh, we'll be announcing the November webinar shortly in our listserv, so keep an eye out for that. Um, if you don't get that announcement, please contact me or Alex if you'd like to attend and we'll get you all set up. Um, you can also contact us if you're interested in joining the Southwest Non-Native Aquatic Species Community of Practice. Um, and we thank you all for your time today. And thank you especially to Dimitri for um, sharing your time with us this morning and sharing such a really cool presentation. So uh, we hope you all have a great Tuesday. Thank you everyone. Thanks Dimitri.
Yep, thank you. Happy fishing.